those who face eternity easily forget what a lifetime means, what an ending means. You know it doesn't have to be this way. No, Kunavai, it does. They need me. Welcome back to End of Dragons Daily. Today we're on part 16. This is the show in which we discuss, speculate, uh, and get ourselves excited about the upcoming Guild Wars 2 expansion, End of Dragons. I need to remember at the start of each video to actually do that little preamble. Because I've always got to be thinking about new viewers. I've got to think about those guys that are coming in and so that they don't get immediately lost. As much as there's like a kind of a, a close-knit community feel to this show as it goes along. I've got to remember, I've got to be growing somewhat. So anyway, I hope you guys are doing good. I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion. I don't mean to sound like a broken record. But man, there's a lot of good questions to choose from. And I'm really happy to dive into them. My mental health has taken a nosedive the past couple of days since this... GameStop stuff really started blowing up. You might remember I made something of an obscure reference to it, like in a video weeks ago. Well, the last few days it seems the whole world is caught up and uh, I'm left in the dust. In any case, let's run on in. First of all, we have, and by the way, thank you all to being so pleasant and so nice to Boots. It was great to have him on the show. I did see a few comments about that and we'll get to them in a second. Like this, Sean Murphy saying, new drinking game, take a shot every time Boots pronounces anti antithesis in a new way. Yeah, I feel kind of bad for Boots on this because I kind of led him astray in the first place. I mean, that's a compound word. Is it a compound word or is it just got a prefix on their antithesis? Anyway, I would just say it as the constituent words together. But my pronunciations, as you guys know, have always been horrendous. And we're going to move into a new era of this when it comes to Canther. I have complimented the world building of Canther relentlessly in the past. And one of the reasons it just feels so authentically East Asian to me. They were so so good with the place names and the character names and stuff, all of which I have absolutely no clue how to say. It'll be fun. First real question from Alex, tons of, tons of Chex Mex, right? Uh, I really hope that theory about Hyosan being a Norn ends up true, Wooden Potatoes. The implications of Norn being established in Cantha is really exciting to me and could totally make up for the shell of Norn exploration we're getting from the absolute gutting of the Ice Brood Saga. It would even have me finally fully looking forward to the end of Dragons. Look, on the topic of Norn in Ice Brood Saga, you know, yes, we've kind of got this confirmation now that this back half of the saga is chopped and changed from the original plan, but I don't really know... Had they gone with another new map after Drizzlewood, for example, would that really have given us much more with the Norn? Maybe it was a mistake to think of this as the Norn's time to shine, the Norn's spotlight. You know, in general, I think maybe that whole concept is wrong. Well, a lot of us started thinking that way when Heart of Thorns came out, and it felt so silvari centric but that's just because maybe, not that they had some grand plan to give every race a moment in the spotlight, but just because they had so much really compelling stuff about the Silvari and their connection to Morgimoth, so that just naturally lent to a Silvari heavy expansion. Maybe they never really cared to do it. I mean, you could say that Path of Fire was human-centric to a certain degree, but only because Balthazar was an antagonist there. It definitely didn't feel as human-centric as Heart of Thorns felt Silvari-centric, did it? I wonder whether, and I really, my gut says this is what's happening, whether the devs are just writing all this stuff as a bit of a melting pot, you know? Uh, I'd like to think the Canthan Norn could even have come across their own oriental spirits of the wild, which could flavour their entire culture from the top down. Maybe these spirits were the vessel for guiding said Norn to this part of the world in our perspective absence. Very fun theory, and I'm really hoping to get more Norn love like this in the future. Yes, uh, I've talked about Norn and Canthan a lot, but not so much this side with the spirits. The idea that they'd have their own unique animals. Look at this comment chain. Uh, I really like the idea of the Norn and the Luxons living together and honoring the spirits of turtle, crab, and snake. This is so good because, yes, you've got these three iconic animals that the Luxons kind of were already revering and they pair up, but in so many ways, the Norn pair with the Luxons. I genuinely look at the Luxons as like the proto Norn. In a lot of ways, I think if you were a super lore enthusiast at the time of Eye of the North's announcement, you might have sneered at the Norn 
because it's like, well, we already did that with the Luxons. I'm not sure how many people identified it, but it's kind of true. It's just that the Norn kind of were bigger and they had the shapeshift and stuff going on and, you know, more of a cold aesthetic rather than this whole thing about this, uh, this Sea of Jade. But they are very, very like-minded. I think this could be brilliant. It's the same sort of thing like when we saw the Flame Legion come down into the regions of Alona and become the Omicron, except this could be 10 times better. I really, really would be thrilled to see that. It's just a shame that geographically... It's the Echo Vault that is kind of nestling into those mountain regions rather than the Jade Sea. But, I mean, who says that the Norn have to live in mountains? They don't necessarily. I mean, they are nomadic to an extent. Maybe they just wandered down, you know? I always love that idea of very tanned uh, Norn that are living in Lion's Arch. You know, sailing around the sun-baked pirate coves of Blood Tide Coast. And that's all, like, vanilla world building. So, who's to say that we won't just have Norn and they won't be in the mountains. They'll be out on the sea. And finally, at the bottom of the comment chain here as well, uh, we have, P.S. Your comment made me think of the movie Moana, them little coconut people being like the new Quag and Slash Choya. Yeah, so I do think that it would be a good idea for End of Dragons to do some kind of new cutesy creature like how we got the Choya with POF. It's funny because it's not really a necessity. There's so many amazing creatures that they could pick from and they would all overlap with Guild Wars 1 counterparts if they wanted to. But going with something new is a nice idea. Several months back now, I actually tweeted out this old Guild Wars 1 concept art. I can't remember if I ever did a, a video on YouTube about it, but check this guy out. Uh, this is real ArenaNet concept art. I think its name is Lobster Bird. Or at least that's what it's titled on the wiki. Maybe that's being informed from somewhere deeper, some portfolio online or something. Uh, and it's it's very funny. It's an interesting idea. These never appeared in the first game, but I, I love the thoughts of the studio looking back at that old, old, old concept art and utilizing it. I mean, I remember when I went to the studio on their walls, they did have Guild Wars 1 concept art, you know, just plastered around. That might inspire people, they might have ideas. But yeah, this is a cool guy, and there's so many fun things to be found, especially for old Canthan concept art. The Mantids are meant to be tarantula bats, guys. They combine the idea of a tarantula with a bat. How horrific is that? And how it ended up in game didn't quite come across, but you know, they could do stuff like that in this expansion again. The Mantids were supposed to be a pest that had built up. Uh, who's to say they're not there 250 years later? Here in editing, I've just found the images for you. So on screen there, that's the spider uh, bat. Here they have another gross insect -y thing. This is the beetle hulk. And then the tentacled gnat as well. Now, the tentacled gnat is actually kind of interesting to me because it feels very chak like to me. It feels almost kind of, uh, you know, Maguma jungle ish in Guild Wars 2. Like, we've already sort of seen it. But so there's obviously a lot that they can play at, even if it's not stuff that probably made it in game. So obviously the topic is pets we'll get. Uh, this comment says, Climbing to the highest points of Echo Vald to capture a rot wallow from those hamster wheel cable carts. Ah, oh, now, as a Guild Wars 1 player, I love this. And actually, let me rephrase that. Not just as a Guild Wars 1 player, but as like a Guild Wars 1 nerd that remembers this stuff, I love this idea. But I don't know whether the devs will really go for it. So, And that's because people are so out of the loop, both on the exact example you're giving and the creature in general. So everyone that doesn't know, in the Encantha, there were generally these creatures, big, blubbery looking, uh, quadrupedal, often necromantic, necromancer professioned creatures called Rotwallows. And when you got to the Echo Vald Forest, there were two of them in particular. One was called Brutus, one was called Sheena. They were basically pets that you could hire as henchmen to join you. Now, in Guild Wars 1, the pets that we could have for our team were... Uh, were a lot smaller. They they were never the idea of like full blown enemies, or rarely so. You know, like a bear was one of the biggest pets you could get outside of like hyper prestige stuff like the Rainbow Phoenix, which we'll talk about again in a moment because that's kind of a canter related too. But so it wasn't fitting as a pet for the first game. You could have them as henchmen. And now here's the question in Guild Wars 2 is it fitting? I think it totally is. Guild Wars 2 isn't scared to have bigger pets. Uh, you know, even just the idea that you can have a drake as a pet, that's quite a big creature that the first game said no to, the, se the sequel said yes to, and that we were so excited. So in all these fronts, I think that Rot Wallows are good, but really, the design of a Rot Wallow, like, what it is, how recognisable it is, 
this is something that really will only appeal to Guild Wars 1 players, I think. Everyone else is just going to look at it and think, ah, oh, that's kind of interesting. And what may be even more interesting is, and I really do think it's just like one cutscene you get to see this. Yeah, there's a moment in the Guild Wars 1 story where you are going along an elevator. And it's powered by a rot wallow in a giant hamster wheel that's running along. And it's moving this, this like lift that's hanging between a rope strung up between two of these massive trees. So you're basically on like a ski lift, so to speak. But it's a full carriage. You're sitting inside it as it takes you uh, through the heights of the Echovald Forest. It's a beautiful scene. I'd really like to see it again. Uh, but will they do rot wallows as pets and all that kind of stuff? Maybe not. I don't know. I, I can see it, but then I can also see why not. On the topic of having guests, Matt says, Hey WP, enjoying the series. Love the idea of more guests in future episodes. Maybe other YouTubers you might not normally collab with. You could tie each episode to different parts of the game based on their area of focus. Who knows, it might even encourage the community growth we'd all like to see. Well, I don't really know about that last bit. And look, I'm happy to do it. I already talked to Boots about the idea of bringing him on again. Anyone who's watched me for a long time will know that I'm pretty much a complete introvert. I don't really outreach on any level. But if someone comes along and says, Hey, I really want to be a guest on the show. Do you think we could just answer some questions together? This is such an easy and quick little thing. Like, I, I literally just chatted to Boots for like half an hour yesterday when we did that. I think that could be fine and maybe quite fun. I'm mostly in mind of just trying to keep the videos feeling a little bit different because you never know when the expansion will come out. So the more I do a weird one every now and then, the better. And uh, yeah, if, if someone outreaches to me, there's a good chance they'll say yes. But I'm, let's face it, unlikely to be the one doing any outreaching. It's just kind of never been my nature. Knocked returns today to say, I still remember the few weeks when you had to do specific events to unlock your Grandmaster traits. That's very similar to the Signet of Capture, and that didn't last at all. He actually messaged me with a mail, or, or was it a Discord message, I think, um, about this too. Now, look, I get that there are similarities. I still, though, am in favor of that old system. Those out of the loop, there was a small window with Guild Wars 2, right around one of the new player experience updates, which made it so that instead of just immediately unlocking your traits as you leveled or after you bought a trait book or whatever, it made it a bigger part of the adventuring. Like, you had to beat a jumping puzzle to get a trait. Or complete a specific meta event in a specific area of the world, and so on. Me and editing here again. Here's a screenshot knocked him. Set the guy that posted this question actually sent me on Discord. I'm, I'm sure he doesn't mind me showing. This was the old UI. I don't think I have any screenshots of this time, but there you have it. It was an update that the community in general backlashed against and was removed after a short period of time. But I still stand by the principles of that update. There are two reasons I think why the community didn't like it. First of all, they're MMO players. They're only interested in their own character's optimization, their own character's progress, their own character's efficiency. And how it felt dropping an update like that in after launch, especially with this specific timing, and this franchise has always geared itself with not pushing you for gear grinding or stuff like that. How it felt was that you had to do extra to get something you already had before, you know? People had experienced a more efficient world, a quicker world, a more casual world, and now they were being told to work harder for it, so they didn't like it. I do think, though, that if that philosophy had been there at the inception of the game, people would have accepted it, and they would have seen the value and the extra feeling of satisfaction to have more tangible rewards for going for jumping puzzles. Like, the reward for doing jumping puzzles now is just some AP and an achievement, which most people will never be invested in. But a game where you are actually getting some kind of mechanic out of being a jumping puzzle, that to me is the superior game, and that is the superior position. But because it came after launch, people rebelled. The other thing was just that ArenaNet had done it incompetently. They had made it so that, like, adept and early game traits that you unlock enough points for, they were only available to collect from end game maps. So you were either encouraging people to go completely out of their way and get their ass handed to them or completely break the pace and the idea of the game. Or you were just giving people this unsatisfied, empty feeling like where it felt like the system was working against them. If they had been a little bit more careful about how they implemented it, if they had more time to think about the specifics, the details. And remember, guys, the, the, the devil is in the details. The details are what will make a concept work or not. I believe that there are very few unworkable concepts. It's just how you implement them. And unfortunately, whether it was they didn't have enough time or whatnot, uh, the devs fumbled the ball on this one. And so then the, the whole update ended up 
up getting torn out. This is again I, why I kind of like the idea of embracing a whole new game sometimes because I think ideas like this they can give another shot as opposed to when you try to release them in an established platform where there's kind of a lot working against you in a lot of ways. Uh, but yes, so going over to what Boots and I said about Signets of Capture, I don't really know how it would look. It, I think it would be a part of the mastery system. I do think it would use special actions. Boots mentioned very briefly that they're elite skills. What a lot of people forget is that sign the Signets of Capture and skill capturing in Guild Wars 1 wasn't just elite skills. You could capture anything you wanted that belonged to the two professions you currently wielded. It's just you could get those regular skills from trainers too, so it was most efficient to spend them only on elites. But, you know, there was a lot that ArenaNet could have done with it in the first game, and they kind of didn't. And there have been opportunities in the sequel. I just don't think it's fundamentally bad. Wade Joyce says, I will literally cry if we can't get a Phoenix pet for Rangers. It's one of my favorite Guild Wars 1 pets. Yeah, I think that this one's a no-brainer. Unlike the Rottweiler thing, I do think we'll get a Phoenix. Hopefully the devs talk more about Phoenix lore and whether we find them in the wild and stuff will be interesting to see. Uh, for those that don't know, there were two Phoenix pets you could get in Guild Wars 1. First, that was just the regular Phoenix. Now, this thing was rare in that you had to beat the campaign. Once the campaign was beaten, you got loaded into a kind of a, a credits map where you could run around and celebrate. There would be fireworks, all the characters from the game would be standing around. You could get one unique green weapon if it was the first time that character beat the campaign. Think a little bit like that last moment at Fort Trinity in Guild Wars 2. When you did the factions one, if you looked far away in the back of the map, in like quite an obscure area, you could find a pet wandering around, a wild phoenix. And it was only there that you as a ranger could collect it. You had to beat the game, you had to beat the final boss with a uh, charm animal skill on, and you needed to not already have a pet. If you did all of those, you could collect this thing. So it was basically a prestige pet. If anything, actually, I would say it was the prestige pet, the very first one. Well, I don't know, the Black Widow Spider predates it. Then, many years later, another prestige pet got added called the Rainbow Phoenix. So you know how in Guild Wars 2, as you build achievement points, you get a new title? Guild Wars 1 had an equivalent like that. There were titles that you got from progressing loads of other stuff on your account. The, the title, title track. And anyway, once you got that to rank 2, I think it was, you had to build it quite far. It's kind of like getting 20k AP in Guild Wars 2, something like that. And if you then went to the scrying pool at Eye of the North, when you loaded in, there would just randomly be a rainbow phoenix flying around there. I think that got added with the Guild Wars Beyond stuff after Eye of the North was all done. Uh, but I don't remember the exact timing. That was a very late game update. The Rainbow Phoenix was just way bigger as a pet. Super flashy and, you know, ridiculous plumage on it. It was released to the game at, you know, that kind of period of time where the devs really started pushing the cosmetics and stuff because they knew that Guild Wars 1's days were essentially numbered. And so then you had the Rainbow Phoenix. So two big Phoenix-oriented pets. While the second one isn't necessarily Canther-related, I feel like they could both come with End of Dragons. Maybe you'll find the Phoenix hidden somewhere in End of Dragons, and then once you collect it, you go back to Eye of the North in Guild Wars 2, and oh look, the rainbow variant's there as well. That'd be kind of fun. I don't know, but I, I like the idea of hidden pets. I, I feel like the devs don't play with that enough. Not really on pets, but Sunny here says, so I typed in game yesterday, what if they brought back Zaishan bounties? And if they made the Zaishan coins a new currency for Guild Wars 2, you can trade up to Z keys, get weapon and armor skins from Guild Wars 1. The currency and quest could be used for the three game modes, PvP, PvE, and World vs. World. This is brilliant. This is a very, very, very good idea. Uh, but I do have some things to temper it. I don't think they'll add a reward scheme to Guild Wars 2 that is specifically about giving you Guild Wars 1 skins. I think that that's a cool idea that you've got there, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a part of the spirit of this whole thing. I doubt the devs will do that. I think they'll keep selling stuff like that, like the Elemental Sword. The footage in the background today is just some random strike mission stuff, and you'll see I've got some Guild Wars 1 skins, but where did I get those? Well, the gem store, and I don't think the devs will be, uh, you know, messing with that in any way. However, the idea of Zaishan Bounties coming back is a great idea. This was a system in the later years of Guild Wars 1 in which they essentially encouraged you to go back and play specific stuff. You know, by the end of things in Guild Wars 1, there were like, what, uh, 50 to 60 full-blown missions you could play and a ton of dungeons you could play and all sorts of stuff. And what this was was a system that said, okay, today, go and do this mission. You do this mission and you can get a Zaishan bounty for it. Now, tomorrow, the Zaishan bounty is going to change. It was essentially Guild Wars 1's daily system. 
And it was very effective, very successful. So what I actually would propose is, again, in very much in line with what I said yesterday, End of Dragons and the End of Dragons era, if we see ArenaNet going really long term with this game, I think you will see over the End of Dragons era a lot of deep system changes, like overhauls and like real working from the ground up to, to improve things. One of the things that could use a ton of improvements is the daily system, really. I think that there's a lot of value that you can get out of that. The idea of two gold for doing a selection of all the stuff they've got and how bloated it is now. I really want to see a rework on that and what perfect situation we have here during End of Dragons. Maybe they could rework dailies and do the Mazaishan bounties instead. And uh, that would be amazing to me. I, I would love to see a merging of the two ideas and the two systems into having a really rich and decent daily setup for Guild Wars 2. That would be fantastic. So I do have a bunch of other comments, but we're at 20 minutes. So here, I'll run through them. Basically, just some ideas for pets that you guys had that I, I really should talk more about. But hey, so Blumines said, I'd love to see Kieran as pets. I always thought they were really unique and different compared to many of the enemies you found in the Echovald Forest. Quite majestic too. Uh, see, I, to me, that feels more mount-like. I, I don't know, because it's one of the closest things we've got to actual horses that we've had depicted in-game. I know that horses are depicted in lore elsewhere, but I, I don't know. I feel like I want to ride a Kirin, and you don't really ride your pets. Unless the Ranger Elite spec is a Cavalier, right? And, you know, that's a whole subject all in its own. Also, you didn't find, find them only in the Echovald. You found, like, the green variant in the Echovald. The more fish-like variant was elsewhere. It's a cool idea. I just, I don't know whether I see that one as a pet, I'm afraid. I think it's a bit too big, a bit too intelligent. And then we have these two ideas back to back. First, NLCZ VRMN saying, I know I'm late to suggest it, but we haven't had any monkey or ape-like pets. Something like a baboon would be cool. That's got me thinking, first of all, that Nightfall had, like, the simians and stuff. And with Path of Fire, they never recreated them. They never did the Natuka. They never did, like, the Elementals. There's a ton of stuff that they could have done. I'm glad we at least got Hydra. Uh, this is an interesting idea, and I'd be in favor of it. There's also the Monkey uh, Tonic that we got with Dry Top. And I know that that seems to have just been, like, something an intern made or in celebration of the Chinese release or, or whatever was going on there. But I wonder if we return to stuff like that with End of Dragons. Ah, uh, if I've got space for extra footage, I should definitely put that in the background today. But, yeah, something like that as a pet might be nice as well. Uh, and then Viator Eagle said, I could see a turtle or a plant creature or salt spray. Now, lots of people talked about salt sprays. I think that that's way too big, personally. But maybe they'll do a new variant of Salt Spray that's a little bit smaller. And then maybe I'll meet you halfway. But I'm a bit cynical on that one. Uh, who knows? Don't forget, they've only got like four or five that they can go for. And there's some just standard kind of, you know, like crab pet, for example. There's some standard stuff that I think that they could cover first. Maybe I'm just nostalgic about having a crab in, in, in Canther. Someone also said a kappa, you know. Uh, I think we should see the kappa come back. I know people, all these zoomers around on Twitch think something very different when they think kappa now. But I, I want to see the mythological creature that was once uh, calling Canther its home. I'd love to see kappa and they could be a great pet too. So there you go, guys. That's End of Dragons Daily. Now, for the next part, I'm actually going to do something a little bit special. We're going to be looking at some official art or screenshots from the expansion that I haven't talked about on YouTube yet. So we're going to do something of a special part. Uh, but the one after that, we will have a topic. Now, I'm going to suggest dailies because I like this idea. I want to hone in on this. What would a perfect daily system look like to you guys in Guild Wars 2? Or, if you don't believe that the daily system needs any work, you can say, look, WP, you're wrong. It's fine. And explain why. Uh, but I think there is a lot of room. And I don't just mean for dailies, by the way. I mean, what would you do with a new daily system? Would you put AP back onto it so that those players that maxed out years ago are starting to do it again? Would you look at the introduction of weeklies or, like, formalizing what we have as weeklies? Because they're kind of there. What about monthlies? Is two gold enough? Maybe we should have five. Give me your comments on that. Other thoughts on pets. If I can't get any good feedback on that one i'll just you know taking an aggregation of all these other amazing sentiments that you guys have got and we'll go from there so thanks guys i hope you enjoyed and i'll see you tomorrow please do remember the discord link down below please do remember patreon as well i'm hoping to have some great news for you guys over there soon and i'll be back before you know